In Silo City, everyone is anxious. The postman's heart skips a beat. A rusty valve hinders the steady flow of hydrocarbon oil in his copper arteries. It's not healthy to run at this pace, but he is propelled by a sudden realization. Three secrets that nobody else knows. His heart condition is not an issue anymore. He will be here again tomorrow. It's time to slow down now, Mr. Postman. Collect your thoughts. Run through them again and again with a fine-tooth comb. Is this really happening? It must be. You know very well where you found the pipe. The moon is not up yet, clearly. Does that prove your theory? Does it prove anything? How about we just wait for the bugle call, Mr. Postman? Take a deep breath and wait. Wait patiently, and let's go from there. Is that him looking out the window, or are you just going insane? Can't really tell at this distance. Okay then, insane it is. It must be him. The trumpet is clearly played liplessly. Liplessly. Mr. Rivet, in the flesh. Lipless though. And as the postman turns around to face Mr. Rivet, there is only one thing he can say. Holy fucking shit. Just think about the waves as you count to seven. Slowly fill your lungs with air. Hold your breath and count to four. Release. One, two, three. Mr. Rivet can never keep track of his pipe. It pops in and out of existence, it seems. As if it had a life of its own.
Here's one way to break the uncomfortable silence. You see, the postman believes that his tall copper hat works like an antenna and picks up messages from the dead. Visibly agitated, balancing on the verge of a mental breakdown, he delivers those messages to random people all over the city. Is this my pipe? It gets uncomfortable for a moment. Very uncomfortable. Probably because it is Mr. Rivet's pipe, sitting in the postman's mouth. Yes, says the postman, his saliva dripping from the mouthpiece of Mr. Rivet's pipe. I have a message for you, he says. Mr. Rivet takes a deep breath and thanks the postman. He will humor him today, because he is already late. And he could use a little help. The postman can't believe his luck. He will be able to see Mr. Rivet at work. Carrying a suspiciously heavy metal can around the city is a nuisance. Most inhabitants of Silo City have an opinion on Mr. Rivet and his morning ritual. We will not discuss those opinions here. They seem slightly too abrasive and would generate unnecessary confusion. But everyone is curious, and so is the postman. He tries to ask politely about the contents of the can, but sensing Mr. Rivet's frustration, he changes the subject. The can is filled to the brim every day, says Mr. Rivet. That is all I am telling you today. Mr. Rivet is visibly tired. He goes on and on about the repetitive nature of his job. And though robots are generally not thought to be pretentious, he does compare it to the waves hitting the beach. The unforgiving cycle of ebb and flow. How does it stay up there, the postman asks, pointing at the sky. Mr. Rivet explains the concept of a sky hook. Although a strongly held belief in a nail floating in the sky seems to be divorced from reality, Mr. Rivet asks the postman to trust him. and wait to see. When Mr. Rivet closes his eyes, he can almost see the skyhook. He can feel its weight suspended in the air as if he is holding it in the palm of his hand. It is quite suspicious that the nail can't be seen. Deep in Mr. Postman's clockwork bowels, a ringing can be heard. It is the bullshit meter going off. Full blast.
Mr. Ribbit says it is obvious that he can't see the nail. It is too small. And, as if to prove his point, nobody has ever seen it. The years of experience, though, make it possible for him to find it in no time. The postman tries to look under the lid, but he is asked for patience. His attention is drawn to the window. You could see behind the wall from here. If you were so inclined, says Mr. Ribbit. Nobody really knows who built the wall. It embraces Silo City in several concentric circles and keeps us inside. You can drill a hole through it, but you will only find another wall. If you find an occasional high window, you may be tempted to peer into the darkness outside, over all the circles. But why would you? There is a house there, and there is someone living in it. The lights are on. What if you see a vague, thin silhouette pointing at you in silence? It has happened before to those curious few who are no longer with us. Suddenly, Mr. Rivet remembers that there is a message, and so does the postman. An insincerely lighthearted exchange solidifies the feeling of tension. Mr. Rivet's chest plate has a quarter jack socket. The gears start turning. And Mr. Rivet's sense of reality dissolves. The message slowly fills the available 64 kilobytes of Mr. Rivet's memory. It's a subpoena. faint memory. Did he break the law? He thinks about the can and its heavy contents. The feeling of guilt sets in. If it wasn't for the fireflies, Silo City would be completely dark. The message ends abruptly, and Mr. Rivet slowly comes to. Although the postman has seen the spectacle many times before, it is never pretty to look at. He calls Mr. Rivet's name. Twice. And then finally, It is time to open the can.
And this is what the moon is made of. Can I have my pipe back? Asks Mr. Rivet. Machine screws, brass microscopes, metal and glass, vintage clock finials, pendulums, rotor coils, and weight shells, copper mechanisms of old clocks which were discontinued a long time ago but still bear the vestigial beauty and elegance of better times. Rust dust. And then, lying comfortably on his stomach with a screwdriver in his hand, Mr. Rivet begins the assembly. Isn't she lovely? Mr. Rivet carefully explains the process. Hanging the moon in the sky is done by means of a long wooden pole. That's what everyone sees. But the part he is really passionate about is the skyhook. He can talk about the skyhook for hours, and after a while of listening to his passionate speech, you can catch yourself thinking that there may actually be a rusty nail there. You know what they say, right? The postman asks. Mr. Rivet stares dispassionately past his companion. He is definitely aware of the gossip. He caused the power outage by hanging the moon on the power lines. The real problem, he thinks, lies with the fact that most people will automatically dismiss the idea of a skyhook. Although he would like to argue his case, he is too engaged in the ritual right now. His side of the story falls to pieces as he stammers on words. And as the postman tries to wrap his head around Mr. Rivet's explanation, he mumbles a string of curse words. Because the moon is actually hanging in the sky. Are we being watched? The incident did take place, but it was blown out of all proportions by that religious fanatic, the Reverend, explodes Mr. Rivet. Leaning against his wooden pole, he argues his case chaotically. The postman cannot hear a thing. He has dazed out. A mental image pops into his head. The Reverend. He whispers. Struggling with the pulleys needing oil, the Reverend rehearses his sermon. Wake up, motherfuckers. The wrath of the goat is coming. It is dark already. There are hardly any fireflies left in Silo City. They will show up again, though, after the lightning storm expected later tonight. The ignition key turns, 
And with that, the buildings start to shake. Something very large starts approaching the city. Is it the wrath the Reverend mentioned? The giant steps are getting closer, and the chimneys shake. Sirens can be heard. They actually do sound like wrath. A little bit. And a lot like bleating. Wrath it is. An enormous robotic hand grasps a handful of tiles. A big robot wrathful hand. And as you catch yourself looking, mesmerized, a member of your family may put down his newspaper and ask from the comfort of his armchair, what is all that noise? The robot's nose pierces the smog and hovers over the rooftops. The weight of the giant bolt makes the machine more stable and may be used as a battering ram. The Teeth, Unexploded Ordnance, September 2nd, 1939. Finally, a goat head shows up. We were right. The sirens did sound like bleating. Amplified coughing through the loudspeakers. The smoke must have filled the interior of the machine. There are not enough chimneys in the whole country to stop the attacker. For a brief moment, Silo City comes to a standstill. You could hear a veritable pin drop. The silence is fraught with the anticipation of the worst. Then someone clears his throat and starts reading. Sinners in the hands of an angry goat. There are loudspeakers installed all over the city. There is nowhere to hide. The sermon is divided into three paragraphs with memorable titles. The Spider. The Archer. The Dam. The goat's eyes are pitch black. Don't let that deceive you. A round kinescope installed on the belly of the robot projects the image of the driver. It's the Reverend. It's a sight to behold, and naturally, most people will start to listen to what he has to say. The Reverend bellows on about the goat, which holds you over the pit of hell like a spider or some loathsome insect. The shrill bleating may further indicate that the goat abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. The goat looks upon you as worthy of nothing less but to be cast into the fire. We should also mention the bow of the goat's wrath, continues the reverend. It is bent, and the arrow is made ready on the string. Justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. There is nothing but the mere pleasure of the goat, and that of an angry goat, that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. The gauges indicate the rising pressure. It's a collective feeling spreading evenly across Silo City, but the Reverend seems tireless. The wrath of the goat is like great waters that are damned for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. The longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course once it is let loose. Tis true, the judgment against your evil works has not been executed hitherto. And right before the Reverend brings his sermon to a devastating conclusion, the intercom starts ringing. Who's going to read the sermon now? So much for instilling them with a sense of fear. I am in the middle of something here, Mr. Scythe, says the Reverend. Mr. Scythe is not sure if he can talk now. The Reverend insists. Prone to overthinking, Mr. Scythe freezes.
The Reverend finds this extremely irritating. And as Mr. Scythe blathers something absolutely incomprehensible, the Reverend interrupts him with a question about the automaton. It has been taken care of, like any other day, but there is just one thing that has been preying on Mr. Scythe's mind. The Reverend pretends he is unaware of the issue at hand. But Mr. Scythe sees right through it. It's about the missing pins on the pinwheel again. Mr. Scythe braces for the worst. Surprisingly, though, the Reverend looks at Mr. Scythe with understanding. He seems to know which part of the automaton Mr. Scythe is referring to. He mentions the Graham escapement, which was an improvement of the anchor escapement, first made by Thomas Tompion, to a design by Richard Townley in 1675. Mr. Scythe can't get a word in edgewise. The Reverend stops him with a quiet gesture. It is obvious that he knows about the anchor escapement and the swing of the pendulum, which pushes the escape wheel backward during one part of its cycle. The Reverend muses briefly over the recoil, which disturbs the motion of the pendulum, causing inaccuracy, and reverses the direction of the gear train. It causes backlash and introduces high loads into the system, leading to friction and wear, which the Reverend finds extremely annoying. Another futile attempt by Mr. Scythe. The main advantage of the deadbeat is that it eliminates recoil, which appears to make the Reverend oddly content. Now, there is also another version of the mechanism which was invented around 1741 by Louis Amont, the Reverend notes. This version of a deadbeat escapement can be made quite rugged. Instead of using teeth, the escape wheel has round pins that are stopped and released by a scissors-like anchor. Silence fills the goat's belly. The Reverend seems incredibly well-versed in mechanical repair. Is it a new quirky hobby of yours? asks Mr. Scythe. No, Mr. Scythe. I have heard the story a million times before, explodes the Reverend. It is a story of something living deep in the bowels of the silent. It hisses at Mr. Scythe, occasionally from the dark corners of the mechanism, as it eats the pins from the pinwheel. Also, he could use a few light bulbs to make the room brighter and see the thing better. The Reverend will have none of it. There is no hissing, and there will be no light bulbs. The conversation is over. I have the data, though, says Mr. Scythe, ready to change the subject. Go ahead, sighs the Reverend. A contrived and unreciprocated goodbye concludes the call. Silence outside is unbearable. Tempers begin to fray. The Reverend needs a quick respite. And the robot's goat hand moves towards the window. Some exasperated individual is writhing in pain, enclosed by the steel grip. Is it possible that the synchronization module is on? The screams cannot be heard inside the goat. It is definite now. The synchronization module is on. 
The soundproof walls of the goat drown the sound of a neck being snapped. What can we say about Mr. Hinge? He was a good man. A decent man. He would always replace the light bulb gone missing in the hall. If a light bulb needed replacement, he was your guy. A bit of a hothead, though. He will be missed in the dark halls of his tenement building. The Sid Chip leaps as the Reverend attempts to access one of the nuns. Give me Nun 34. Pull back. Give me a hard copy right there. The nuns float through the city. Their vacant Polaroid eyes scan the environment. Blurred movement in your peripheral vision. Should you hear the aperture click, behave. Mr. Scythe's shack is full of secrets. If you live in Silo City, you know Mr. Scythe. The polished aluminum armor. The puffing noise of safety valves drains confrontational moods around him. Thank you. 
checks today's reading and contemplates which bottle to open. Perhaps all of them. 165 over 90. Essential hypertension. Fuck. steam running through the spaghetti of copper tubes in Mr. Scythe's body turns the wheels and pushes the pistons. It must force its way through some faulty junction. The defect that remains undiagnosed due to doctor's general inability and a complete lack of professionalism. Obviously. Vitamin D, regulating the absorption of calcium and phosphorus, facilitating normal immune system function. Folic acid helps the body produce and maintain new cells. The spike in the pressure might have been incidental. As he checks the reading again, his breathing becomes heavier. The tension rises in his ears, a vicious cycle. And vertigo. Certain diseases, such as high blood pressure, might provoke lower levels of coenzyme Q10. Cordyceps mushrooms. Mr. Scythe read somewhere that they are approved in China for the treatment of arrhythmia. It's getting better now, Mr. Scythe. Think about the box in the corner. And its cool contents. It's definitely getting better now. The blood pressure goes down to its healthy levels.
seriously need to calm down, Mr. Scythe. Get into character. You are a state executioner. Quick, before someone sees how weak you are. The relays in Mr. Side's head click on and off, seemingly at random. The air is electric again. It might be the broadcast from the goat. Just a pipe full of cherry-flavored tobacco, and Mr. Scythe will be on his way. In his shiny rocket ship. The navigation system sounds a bit off today, telling Mr. Side that he will plunge into the bottomless gulf. It might be picking up the sermon from the goat. Mr. Side's patience is being tested. He will rely on the biometer today. I swear to God, says Mr. Side, if it wasn't for the job, I would jump the wall and leave this city. It's almost impossible to find your way in here. The street lamps do not work, and the city planning makes no sense. If you look at the map, it is all very clear and logical on the outskirts. You can easily trace your path with your finger there, but as you get closer to the center, you will lose all hope. Right by the silo, there is a statue of two land surveyors, who bravely undertook the challenge of drawing a reliable map of the city. Even though there is a direct link between their work and a wave of fatal car accidents, the authorities still decided to commemorate them. The statue's completion was marked by a parade. It was a very uncomfortable evening. Biometer of Hippolyte Baraduk, an instrument which registers vibrations and nervous forces of human bodies. It has been working just fine until now, Mr. Scythe reassures himself. It's a bunch of pseudo-scientific crap, a voice in his head whispers. The movements of the needle are due neither to heat nor electricity. Life is not the chemical function of an organ, but the result of an intelligent element. 
Mr. Scythe is adamant about this issue. You have been brainwashed by that religious freak, the voice of reason interrupts. Incidentally, has the needle ever pointed at you, Mr. Scythe? We've all had those heated conversations with our doppelganger on our way to work. The device that Mr. Scythe is referring to is called a biometer. The nuns are set to investigate wherever the needle points. The executioner walks right in their footsteps. Haven't you been having those dreams lately? It's odd how the needle never points at you. Or does it, Mr. Scythe? Another intrusive thought has to be addressed. Sooner or later, you will just need to look at yourself in a mirror and confront the sad truth. You are a fucking moron. The last working light bulb in Silo City. It lights up the glade and makes it possible to find your way through the park up on Liberty Hill. If it dies now, Mr. Chestnut will have to drink in complete darkness. And you absolutely have to drink if you are Mr. Chestnut. Because of the tannoy system installed by his right ear the more sensitive one. It's unbearable. Mr. Chestnut has had plenty of time to contemplate the hellish principles reigning in the souls of wicked men. The principles that could kindle and flame out into hellfire if it were not for the goat's restraints. Yeah, right. He is not buying this shit. The speaker buzzes on. The wrath of the Almighty Goat is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of this congregation. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape with your lives. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. Mr. Chestnut is not going anywhere. He is not impressed by this nonsense. Cool as a cucumber. This is just perfect. Mr. Chestnut examines the light bulb with shaky hands. The cucumber vanishes into thin air. The frustration is like great waters that are damned for the present. They increase more and more. They rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And then it gets quiet. Mr. Rivet's face is cold from the wind. It must have been against him. It is coming from the south. Mr. Chestnut is glad to see his friend. His heartbeat comes back to normal as he is complimenting Mr. Rivet on today's moon. Nice and shiny. Well-balanced, very reflective. 
Mr. Chestnut skillfully avoids mentioning the moon's electrical conductivity. He is a good friend indeed. Mr. Rivet reciprocates the courtesy by asking about the news from behind the wall. Is it really possible to see behind the wall? Mr. Chestnut is absolutely convinced. He can talk about the house behind the wall for hours. It is a pretty unnerving sight to see him staring into the impenetrable dark forest. Past the trees. And the wall. His strange trance interrupted by a facial twitch. His roots burrowing deep into the ground and peeking behind the wall. Nobody believes him. There is no way he can see what's past the wall. The moon looks stunning today indeed. Looks like solid brass. Mr. Rivet has very strong opinions on brass, copper, and aluminum. What makes him slightly angry is that one plated fucking piece of goddamn... Mr. Chestnut offers Mr. Rivet a drink. He really does not want to hear about the differences between solid copper and copper plated things. Not again. Although Mr. Chestnut hates bringing it up. Again. He just has to ask about the dreams. Mr. Rivet has been having a lot of them lately. In his dream there is a lumberjack. His axe is lodged into a tree. His clothes are tattered and they are rustling in the wind, just like the leaves. All those little rags and patches stitched together over the years, and then he falls. He is writhing in pain and grinding his teeth to dust. His forehead sweats and a vein pops open. He looks up and sees the moon, its glowing red and outlining the silhouettes of the treetops. The gnarly branches and finger-like twigs hold the moon tightly. The lumberjack tries to stand up, but he can't. He is overwhelmed by the throbbing pain in his chest. The moon is pulsating and humming. Then everything fades to black. The lumberjack falls asleep in the red glow. There is something Mr. Rivet has been carrying in his pocket. If the breathtaking moonlight is not enough for this ungrateful friend. Sixty watts. It's perfect. And definitely calls for a celebration. This one is on the house. Just don't ask Mr. Rivet where the light bulb came from. Accept the gift, and let's move on. The glade gets a bit brighter. There is someone else here. It's the postman. He can explain the light bulb situation in our city. It feels a bit like an unwanted intrusion, a lack of social skills. Voiceover nobody asked for. The Postman. Mr. Rivet is not sure he heard his name right. And Mr. Chestnut knows where this shit is going. My name is says Mr. While Mr. Rivet is trying hard to repeat the word. Mr. Chestnut braces for a ride. Mr. Rivet is not even close. Most people make the same mistake. Introduces himself, and by the way, notice how carefully and clearly he pronounces his name. He especially emphasizes the initial syllable, as if to make sure it's heard properly. It's Still, not a single person can pronounce it properly. Mr. Chestnut knows why. Because of the relation of habitual thought and behavior to language. He might have heard the story before. Once or twice. 
Another bottle suggests itself quite naturally at this point. Bottoms up, gentlemen. <phone rings> has lost the thread of thought. Mr. Rivet is on his toes. The relation of habitual thought and behavior to language. Is it possible that Mr. Rivet has heard the theory before? Perhaps. From whom? Is repeating himself? That's not it. One way or another, what is postulating cuts very close to the bone. And so everyone is listening. Silo City is at the mercy of the particular language that has become its medium of expression. Quite unnaturally at that, it's not the darkness that lies at the root of the shared anxiety. Not the bulblessness. What is it then? It's simple. We see and hear and otherwise experience as we do because the language habits of our community predispose certain choices of interpretation. Herein lies our issue. The language of Silo City is filled to the brim with words that make Mr. Rivet mispronounce the postman's name. Not a single one that sounds anything like The language makes it absolutely impossible to hear the name properly. Mr. Rivet regrets talking to the postman now. Just call me Mr. Postman, she says. The postman's absolute lack of social skills may stem from the fact that he is a writer. He has been working on the Chronicles of Silo City for years, explains Mr. Chestnut. And as attempts to resume his argument, Mr. Rivet tries to see the common denominator between the impenetrable darkness and his own language. Naturally, Mr. Chestnut says that it is not that impenetrable. But he is told to shut the fuck up. Let me ask you a simple question, says Where are we? Chestnut Glade, last time I checked, Mr. Rivet answers mechanically. District. Liberty Hill. City. Silo City. Country. Poland, what's your point, riddle man? Why are we speaking English? The postman asks. That came quite unexpectedly. Nobody has an answer. Not a good one. What happened to our language? How did all of us give it up so easily? The postman knows. It started with the ventriloquist coming to town. Mr. Rivet sniffs his bottle suspiciously. Is there something in this drink? Hold on. We are not speaking Polish? Mr. Chestnut whispers to himself. Nobody saw that one coming. Suddenly, the relation of habitual thought and behavior to language does not seem like such an odd thing to be talking about. There is something there. Enter the ventriloquist and his puppet. Mr. Rivet starts to remember, vaguely. And so does Mr. Chestnut. It started with the poster. Remember when the ventriloquist arrived in Silo City? We had all been waiting for the performance. I know I had. You must have felt the same. Remember those outrageous lino cut posters? That's right. The ventriloquist. What the fuck was his name? There we all were, gathered at the Silo City Public Library. We were all ready to be carried away. On that eagerly awaited day, the ventriloquist and his actors introduced all of us to the mysteries of the Orient. Mr. Rivet remembers now. The snake charming. 
swallowing swords, fire breathing. He was there, at the edge of his seat, trembling with excitement. However amazed we all seemed, the anticipation of the climactic stunt, the resurrection of dead matter, was slowly devouring us from the inside. You know it. You were both there. It went dark, and then we all saw the great ventriloquist and his puppet, the Reverend, in the deadly pale spotlight. It actually took him over an hour to build up a questionable and uneven performance. A little vein pops in Mr. Chestnut's chestnut brain. There were still vestiges of a long-gone talent there, Mr. Rivet adds. Most of his jokes were too vulgar, though. Their punchlines lost in what seemed to be simultaneous translation from his native language. But his technique of bringing the puppet to life was impeccable. I remember being mesmerized, trying to figure out his ledger domain. He was slouching there in his chair, oblivious, his mouth slightly open. At one point, I noticed a thin, almost invisible trickle of saliva dripping down from the corner of his mouth. It was not the most disturbing aspect of the performance, though. He had been hit by a horse-drawn carriage right before the show, and the puppet took over. Then the speakers popped up all over the city. If you are a state executioner, it's difficult to make your presence welcome. Try as you might. Mr. Scythe starts by offering them a light, asking their name. Are you Mr. Rivet? No. His name is There is a silo in the center of our city. The salty air slowly takes its toll on the metal walls. They are old and rusty. The constant hum is inescapable if you live here. Mr. Scythe doesn't notice it anymore. The mechanism inside the silo powers a device that is used for executions. It's Mr. Scythe's job to keep it working. He spends most of his day by the pinwheel, the heart of the automaton. replacing the missing pins. There is someone at the door. The Reverend's voice makes Mr. Scythe jump, and he drops his pipe. Again. The Reverend wants to know if the automaton is ready. It is. The main axis has been oiled, and the pin switched. The Reverend notices that Mr. Scythe needs a moment to collect himself.
he is going to be fine. For now. When the whole city is asleep, the Reverend is here. Listening and fine-tuning the life within the city walls. That copper pipe over the TV in your childhood home, you never knew what it's for. A piece of wire dangling from the ceiling. Mysterious tubular structures interspersed throughout Silo City, disappearing behind the wall into the darkness. People may ignore them on a daily basis, but they are all there for a reason. They all weave a net that slowly gets thicker and thicker as it approaches the silo. Here, it reaches the climax of its complexity. Remember the map? I don't suppose Johann Manhart ever imagined that his ingenious escapement mechanism could play an important role in this clockwork. Powering our silo. Pumping dreams. The flow is thick and gooey. Store all of them. There is at least one dream here for every inhabitant of Silo City. There's one here that belongs to Mr. Scythe. Does he know that? Does he know that his dream has been examined? Does he think it was an infringement of privacy? Which dream was it? He is wondering how it got here. It hasn't been extracted, obviously. But yet somehow, it's here. Perhaps the Reverend is right. Perhaps the pipe system works. The Reverend doesn't understand it either. He has made a mistake and attributed someone else's dream to Mr. Scythe. Maybe. Let's not worry about it now. Mr. Scythe has barely finished calibrating the instrument. But the Reverend is not particularly eager to see it. Is anyone going to be examined today? The Liberty Hill folks, perhaps? The Reverend has been spending a lot of time on their dreams lately. They are a rambunctious bunch, Mr. Scythe. But today the Reverend needs your expertise. Mr. Scythe feels caught off guard. Shit's definitely afoot. How long have we known each other? The Reverend asks. It's easy to lose track of time here. It's been a while. Years. Disassembling Hippolyte Baraduk's biometer and putting it back together. Day by day. Analyzing the dreams pouring into the silo. Thick flow. Heating up the brass tubing. Is this just an elaborate hoax? Mr. Scythe loves tuning the automata, but ignores the more esoteric aspects of his job. He'd like to keep it that way. He finds it difficult to believe that it's powered by dreams and he knows the machine well. It works and serves its purpose well. However we define that purpose is up to debate. The Reverend disagrees. The purpose is to extract more dreams. It's a perpetual motion machine. There is a method and a beauty to the mechanism that surrounds Mr. Scythe and the Reverend. It's made of machine screws and brass microscopes. Metal and glass, vintage clock finials, pendulums, rotor coils, weight shells, and perhaps more than anything else, copper mechanisms of old clocks which were discontinued a long time ago, but still bear the vestigial beauty and elegance of better times. Rust dust. 
the Reverend is convinced that he can trace the infinitely small particles of the fluidic invisible, put them under a microscope, and open up the path to the spontaneous determinism of life itself. The silo is full of insubordinate dreams. One of them sounds too familiar. There is a hurdy-gurdy player. He wakes up deep in the heart of the forest, and there's no darkness like this anywhere else in the world. The Reverend obviously doesn't know what a hurdy-gurdy is, but Mr. Scythe explains it well. It's a crank fiddle, an instrument with a crank-turned rosin wheel which rubs against the strings. Imagine a box with a crank. You turn the crank, and the music plays. You know what a crank is, don't you? Was that over the line, Mr. Scythe? The hurdy-gurdy player, deep in the heart of the forest. He does not remember how he got there. He tries hard, and the harder he tries, the more confused he gets. It's as if the past has been erased. He starts suspecting the worst. A stroke. Some people tend to gravitate towards the negative, especially when it comes to their health. Is this a jab? Perhaps it's a defect that remains undiagnosed due to doctors' general inability and a lack of professionalism. The tension is rising in Mr. Scythe's ears. He notices that the Reverend has digressed from his main point. He's lost now. Let's get back to the main story. The dream. In the corner of his eye, the hurdy-gurdy player sees an instrument. A hurdy-gurdy. It is just sitting there on a tree stump. And, as if to verify that he really is who he thinks he is, he puts the hurdy-gurdy on his lap and starts turning the crank. He's still got it. The music is extraordinary. Surprises him. His left hand feels very strong, and his right hasn't lost any of its agility. It's not a stroke, then. The trumpet speaks rhythmically. The trumpet? The Reverend is confused. Mr. Scythe has dazed out into a half-dream, but is called to attention by the Reverend. I thought he was playing a hurdy-gurdy. He is playing a hurdy-gurdy, Mr. Scythe responds. But you wrote that he plays the trumpet, right here. Mr. Scythe explains that it's not a trumpet, but trumpet. It's just a side note. He did not write it. He might have dreamt it. A trumpet is a part of the hurdy-gurdy that makes a rhythmical noise and sounds a bit like a buzzing string on a broken guitar bridge. Perhaps if the main character of the story were not a hurdy-gurdyist, but played the piano, or indeed, the trumpet, the story would be much easier to tell. The correct nomenclature is hurdy-gurdy player, not a hurdy-gurdyist, Mr. Scythe argues. And again, it's not a story, it's a dream. As he is playing the hurdy-gurdy, his anxiety is lifted. The music swings through the forest. The trees swing with the music. And so is the hurdy gurdyist The hurdy-gurdy player. Left and right. The leaves rustling in the wind. And the crackling sound of the ancient oak trees chime in. The notes are falling from the treetops and hit every branch on their way. They fill the hurdy-gurdy and rattle. On time. Some will be found later, lodged in the crevices of the wrinkled bark, which expands and contracts. It's breathing, in and out. He is actually playing the forest now, controlling it with the tiniest adjustments of the crank. Initially, he is comfortable with that thought, a bit delusional, you might argue but it somehow generates interesting ideas that just keep coming. He slowly builds up the speed, and indeed the trees start swinging faster, and the rustling gets more intense. Soon enough, the wind turns into a gale hissing through the forest and bending the tree trunks almost to the breaking point. 
He has successfully managed to freak himself out, so he decides to slow down. But he can't. He is trying to push against the crank, first just a tad, then harder until he realizes that it's worse than he expected. He can't let go. His wrist starts to swell. It hurts like hell. At this point, the trees are starting to fall left and right, their gnarly branches cutting his cheeks and wrap around him like snakes, all to the accompaniment of the devilish music from the hurdy-gurdy. It's brilliant and disturbing. Well, perhaps disturbing is just the corollary of the fact that the fucking forest is alive and tries to devour him. Encased in a cocoon of intertwined branches and twigs, he is lifted and hung upside down. Now the cocoon starts to shrink and constricts him like snakes. The crank keeps going, though. It keeps going until there's a loud pop. As if something broke or caved in. It's all so quiet now. Everything fades to black. He falls asleep. Time is running out, so Mr. Rivet asks about the automaton. Is it possible he knows about the Harrow, Mr. Scythe wonders? How does the Harrow work, asks Mr. Rivet. All right. Somehow he knows about the Harrow. There is this intricate network of pipes running under the city, explains Mr. Scythe. But Mr. Rivet knows about the pipes as well. He can't possibly know about the pipes, but he does. He knows about the pipes. Does he know about the Transformer? Well, the Transformer is made up of two coils. We supply the steady current of dreams to the primary coil of the transformer and it produces a field. This field sweeps across the secondary coil which produces an alternating current that goes back and forth. It is all very obvious to Mr. Scythe. Mr. Rivet asks about the ominous glow on top of the mountain. He knows it can't be the moon. By this time, it is way past the mountain, past the wall. The current itself cannot produce any visible effect, explains Mr. Scythe. Fireflies. Mr. Rivet's suggestion thickens the atmosphere. They are said to come from up there. Mr. Scythe does not know anything about fireflies. He emphasizes the point quite strongly. Far away from here, Mr. Chestnut is looking at the bottles budding on his branches, buzzing and flickering. It's a plague. If you live in Silo City, you know the buzzing sound that never ceases. It's their metal blade wings and threaded legs rubbing against each other constantly. Thank God for the glow. It is their only redeeming quality. The city needs all the light it can get. We ignore the itchy bites, as long as it gets a little brighter here. The glow, Mr. Scythe breaks the silence. 
Maybe it's the vacuum tube, which amplifies the alternating current, or the modulator tube. They do glow, both of them. It's not the fireflies. It can also be the oscillator tube that sends the signal from the generator into the modulator tube. It's definitely not the fireflies. Mr. Rivet wants to know about the generator. It provides a steady current to the oscillator tube with a crystal inside, explains Mr. Scythe. The whole thing produces a high frequency alternating current, several thousand cycles per second. The rest is quite straightforward. The dream current modulates the high frequency current in the modulator tube. Then off to the power tube and straight into the harrow. And then the harrow wakes up, Mr. Rivet jumps in. She wakes up all right, runs an in-depth analysis of your dreams. It's quite a sight but you will see for yourself. It's time to lose the cuffs. The voice in the speaker seems familiar. You should have been here an hour and five minutes ago. I may be late, but at least I've come, Mr. Rivet responds flippantly. Something has changed about Mr. Scythe. There is a tether running from the harrow into Mr. Scythe's aluminum armor. Go ahead, step up. A large metal object is said to have been the direct cause of the power outage in the city. I have summoned you here today because this should ring a bell. Does it, Mr. Moonhanger? Are you going to run my dreams through the harrow now? You have come prepared. There is a lumberjack. He is unable to cut the tree because of the debilitating pain in his chest. While he is convulsing helplessly on the mossy floor, the glowing of the moon over his head appears to be the source of his strife. Then sleep overtakes him and everything goes black. In his dream he is a musician, a busker. He finds himself deep in the heart of the forest, dark and impenetrable. He spots a hurdy-gurdy sitting on a tree stump. He picks it up and starts playing. The forest comes alive and encloses him in a cocoon of sticks, twigs, and branches. Dangling upside down and incapacitated, he is overwhelmed by sleepiness. Another dream begins, deeper than the one before. Would you like to hear the ending? The metallic voice of the harrow sends shivers down Mr. Rivet's spine. But that's only partially his dream. That hurdy-gurdy part is questionable. He has never dreamt of a hurdy-gurdy. Not to mention a hurdy-gurdy player. Would you like to hear the ending? The harrow asks again. There is no choice, really. There is a preacher. The authority in charge of the execution does not like that part, but the knobs controlling the harrow are not responsive. The preacher is squashed. It's an uncomfortably small space. The smell of mold and rust exacerbates the pain. His belly is open and his intestines stretch out into a metal axis over his head. There is barely any room to move. He is trying to preach about a bloody swath cut through the city, but he is preaching through pain. The Reverend would like it to stop now. It's too late. 
she is in charge. Then the axis starts to turn, first slowly, but soon it builds up speed and pulls out more and more of the slippery intestines. The pain becomes unbearable, and the preacher bursts the confines of the hurdy-gurdy. He is thrown upwards, towards the glowing moon, which he pierces with his pointy nose. The hum finally stops, and so does the piercing pain. What is this vertigo? Some defect in the Reverend's heart that remains undiagnosed due to doctor's general inability and a complete lack of professionalism? Obviously. It dawns upon Mr. Rivet that the lumberjack can finally get up and cut the tree. Fuck yeah, the Harrow exclaims. What is going to happen to Mr. Rivet now? He feels her fingers, first gently, but then the grip tightens. Mr. Rivet remembers his chiropractor and all his suave bullshit. A loud pop, and it gets really quiet. How long does a severed head remain conscious? Can Mr. Rivet still see his moon slowly approaching the power lines? The postman's heart skips a beat. A rusty valve hinders the steady flow of hydrocarbon oil in his copper arteries. It's not healthy to run at this pace, Mr. Postman. But you are propelled by a sudden realization. Three secrets that nobody else knows. Your heart condition is not an issue anymore. You will be here again tomorrow. Mr. Syed's heartbeat slows down. The hypertension disappears as he is looking at a swarm of fireflies over his head. Some stick to the moon, which makes its way across the wall. Now a glow is slowly moving over the barren land. There is a house there and the lights are on. Mr. Scythe can see dim lights somewhere deep in the heart of the forest.
Budding bottles on the branches buzz brightly with bugs. The bottles first become perky and globe-shaped, and then turn into light bulbs. Although Mr. Scythe cannot witness these miracles, he is well aware of them. Some fireflies outline a recognizable shape. It is a bird. Mr. Scythe can see its wings, the beak, the comb, even the wattle. It does look a little like a rooster. The bird flies away and perches on the silo. Then it sneaks in through a crack in the wall and hides in the mechanism by the pinwheel. The pins are delicious indeed. The bird will wait here for Mr. Scythe. Tonight, it will whisper the whole story to him. All of this is deeply disturbing because, as we know, roosters cannot fly. The whole day weighs heavy on Mr. Scythe's shoulders, and he tries to relax the kink in his neck by slowly breathing into it. Lifting the wooden box is a bit of a struggle. It is filled to the brim. The reverend will never know. After his heart attack, he left the city in a horse-drawn carriage. Mr. Scythe masks the rattling of the light bulbs with a cough. Breaking the light bulbs one by one, Mr. Scythe releases fireflies from the vacuum. The darkness of the forest lights up for a split second. Mr. Scythe finds himself in the center of a lightning storm. home. Finally. Mr. Scythe can take off the mask now and let the pores of his skin breathe. He cuts the executioner's armor into tiny little pieces. They will not go to waste. Is the day over, or has it just begun? It is all very confusing. Thank you.